Oh, Welcome back to Marvelous Videos. I'm Rylan, and this is 15 Underrated Deadliest Reptilian Monsters in Movies. Backstories explored in great detail. Okay, let's get one thing straight, guys. When it comes to reptilian monsters, they are precisely what nightmares are made of. Or at least they are for a lot of people. We are particularly thinking along the lines of the scaly, slimy, slithering ones that just love to wreak unthinkable havoc. These creatures are absolutely deadly, and their terrifying presence has often secured them a rather special spot in the genre of horror. But then again, while some of them have been able to impress the critics, there are still a lot of these reptilian monster films that have either critically failed, are poorly marketed, have had some mixed reviews, or, in some cases, confusing trailers. But let's not disregard the fact that these are the movies that really did change and reconceptualize the course of horror films, to a direction that they remain as classics till this very day, garnering a massive cult following at the same time. So, in today's video, we're going to talk about 15 of these underrated, deadly reptilian monsters from movies exploring their backstories in great detail. So, are you ready? Before we get into today's explanation though, we ask for a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it definitely means a lot. Thanks. Now, let's begin. A gift. Beyond man. Clue, Alien Creatures, Rucka Short Film by Oat Studios. Neil Blomkamp's American-Canadian military science fiction short film boasted a current 7.4 IMDb rating and a runtime of 22 minutes and is divided into three parts, World, Amir and Nosh, and Siege. This horror short is a tale of a dystopian future where an unknown alien group, the technologically superior and highly aggressive reptilian aliens known as the Klum, have taken over the Earth. The horde of these ruthless and ostensibly unstoppable extraterrestrials is seen throughout the planet, as per their living conditions, from terminating cities, scorching forests, and constructing megastructures that are gradually terraforming the planet to the extent of pumping out methane, they are making it quite difficult for humans to breathe, and also flooding cities, which are near the oceans. As for the surviving humans, they mostly live underground, or are scattered among the ruins, having just enough rations, weaponries, and ammunition to keep on fighting, using whatever they can against the Klum technology. Now, if you were a fan of any science fiction movie, Aliens and Sigourney Weaver, well, this movie is categorically for you. All you need to do is just pay attention to this short film for a minute, and you will have your eyes glued to the screen, wanting it to be made into a full-length film. We were once mankind. We were humanity. Pronounced as Klum, the Klum are a race of reptilian aliens showing exceeding levels of aggression towards the humans. By the year of 2020, they have already committed colossal acts of genocide on the human race, eradicated or enslaved surviving humans that they have chanced upon, and established themselves as the primary race on Earth. They clearly didn't stop conquering Earth. They went on terraforming the planet as per their needs, making it harder for the humans to breathe. On Earth, they set fire to our forests. It's already hard to breathe. Humans, who are taken now as prisoners, are either used as living incubators, receiving painful deaths of their offspring, or by forceful conversion into human loudspeakers, impelling humans to surrender themselves into their conservatories. Once they are in, very few humans have managed to escape. Now, one is bound to wonder what it is that's making these reptilian aliens so hard on the humans in the first place. Well, it's because the beings that these creatures had once regarded as gods had eventually turned their backs on them. Also, because their species were lesser in number. It was likely that they had psychological problems and were often seen as impure by the humans. So, as revenge, the Klum had devised plans of annihilating every last trace of humanity for their cause. We don't know the world that they came from, but what we do know is that it's quite possible that their planet had an atmosphere that was entirely composed of methane, 
Physically speaking, of course, they are quite terrifying to look at. Hats off to the incredible creature design. So, what we have in front of us is a bipedal, crocodile-like monster that is about 8 to 9 feet tall and has 6 limbs. Let's not forget about its needle-sharp teeth, a tongue that is forked, and 9 small black eyes. <laughs> we kid you not. The Klum makes use of Swax, which is a black liquid-like material acting out like programmable matter. These monsters use Swax for literally every facet of their technology, right from their armaments, vehicles, armor, to the extent of even atmospheric processing. Mind you, they also have this power of controlling humans and having them under telepathic control if the latter looks into their eyes. Creepy, right? Don't do it, Martinez! Don't do it! Well, full credits to the CGI and VFX teams on display here. It's only because of such technicalities that there will be consequential nightmares to follow. Still don't believe us? Well, just head over to YouTube and give Raka a shot right away. Don't come to us later saying we didn't warn you. Alpha Dragon, Reign of Fire 12-year-old Quinn Abercrombie goes to see his mother at London Underground construction site, where the latter works as a project engineer. But with the crew digging a tad deeper, they inadvertently awaken a prehistoric predator from its sleep, one who happens to be a fire-breathing dragon. The sole survivor of this unfortunate incident happens to be Quinn, and the story moves ahead 20 years in a timeline that's infested by those dragons. Quinn is all grown up, and leads a small community of survivors at the Bamberg Castle in Northumberland. Soon, hope comes in the form of Denton Van Zan, who is the leader of a heavily armed American group. Having found out the weakness of the species, he has managed to slay many of their kind along with his crew. Van Zan enlists Quinn's help, and although this means that the latter has to confront his own dreadful memories from the past, especially the painful memory of his own mother's death, the duo eventually decide to join hands and put an end to the dragons once and for all. No points for guessing who the Alpha Dragon is, but for those who still haven't seen the movie, the Alpha Dragon is the one who is ultimately responsible for the death of Quinn's mother at the beginning of the film. Presumably, the only male dragon in the flick, it is quite a possibility that this is the very dragon who is actually the progenitor of the species. So, there's a high chance that the male dragon was responsible for not only creating the female offsprings, but also mating with them to breed more of them. The Alpha Dragon is a pure killing machine. He does not really have much of a personality or a character to be specific. He likes to kill, and he is quite notable for ambushing and destroying Van Zandt's army, destroying the castle as well as killing Van Zandt. Physically speaking, the beast has a shorter snout, smaller cheek horns, longer head horns, and a very large lower jaw horn. Of course, he is way larger than the regular female dragons on display here, and being the oldest, he has a colossal size and covered in scars. Those gigantic leathery wings also seem a bit ragged given his age and the number of battles that he's fought in his lifetime. Being the apex predator of the dragons, he is seen resorting to cannibalism, devouring female dragons in just a few bites. Driven mostly by instinct, the Alpha Dragon also displayed quite the level of intelligence, and that, coupled with his fire-breathing skill, easily made him the most superior leader of the dragons. His powerful abilities include physical strength, speed, durability, flight, sharp teeth, and let's not forget his primary weapon, his proficiency in breathing fire. Mind you, he and his kind had this unique gland in their mouth that was capable of generating a flammable substance, one that could very easily be ignited. But here's an interesting trivia fact for you. The method by which the dragons are shown emitting fire was in reality inspired by two real animals. We are specifically talking about the Bombardier Beetle and the Spitting Cobra. The Alpha Dragon met his death in the hands of Quinn, when the latter fired his explosive bolt straight into his mouth resulting in the former getting exploded from the inside out.
Cromorock, also known as the Skull Crawler from Kong Skull Island. A monarch expedition to the uncharted Skull Island results in the bombing of the island with seismic explosives. This is mainly done to map out the island, the underground world beneath, and also to prove the hollow earth theory by seismologist Houston Brooks. But doing this accidentally brings the attention of an entire race of deadly subterranean reptilian creatures known as the Skull Crawlers. Wondering who is Ramarok? Well, that is the primary antagonist of Jordan Vote Roberts 2017 monster film Kong Skull Island. One that often makes it on the list of the most terrifying creatures. You lost it. it goes without saying that the creature here has quite a few names. Also known as the Big One, the Skull Devil, and the Skull Crawler, it is not only the supreme leader of the Skull Crawlers, but also the arch nemesis of Kong. Not only has the creature been oppressing the island for years with its terrifying presence, but it also happens to be responsible for the death of Kong's kind. A mix between what looks like a lizard and a snake, this subterranean predator and his kind have an insatiable appetite. We are guessing that this is because of their boosted metabolisms. Ramarok has an enormous serpentine body, boasting two very powerful forelimbs with spikes on the elbows a pretty long prehensile tail, a long triple forked prehensile tongue, and a face that eerily looks like a crocodile skull. The creature is extremely durable. It is seen with standing bullets, and still has the same amount of stamina on display, not even for once stopping or slowing down for that matter. It doesn't even take the creature much time to subdue Kong, and it does so effortlessly. Well, there is a specific scene in the film that shows Ramarok maliciously licking the face of a tangled up Kong, all in the midst of a rather intense fight scene between the two. The creature also appears to be very intelligent when it simply refuses to eat a grenade armed human, despite having a perchant for devouring anything that's fleshy. Stressing on its abilities, it is very persistent, especially in going after its target. It can run very fast and make rapid turns, dodge, and counterattack most of the strikes of its rivals. Of course, it is very powerful, and this shows when it comes to the fighting scenes with Kong, despite the latter weighing 158 tons. One of the highlights of the movie was definitely when it flung Kong all across the lake with just its tail. But then again, it was equally a treat to see Kong smashing a very heavy boulder on his very head. The scene that stole the thunder, however, was how it met its demise. We are stressing on the part that shows Kong pulling out his tongue, and in the process, also its internal organs that were connected with each other. Blissful? Yes, indeed. Tiao Tie, The Great Wall. A group of European mercenaries commute all the way to China, looking for the secret to gunpowder. However, just a few miles north of the Great Wall of China, they get ambushed by a monster. Out of the whole group, only two manage to survive, Irishman William Guerin and Spaniard Pero Tovar. While the duo manages to cut off the arm of the monster, they are taken as prisoners by General Shao, strategist Wang, and their soldiers. While imprisoned in the Great Wall, they chance upon Sir Ballard, also European, who now works as an English and Latin teacher. Ballard had come to China 25 years before, likewise looking for gunpowder. Very soon, they discover a shocking truth about the soldiers of the Nameless Order. They exist to fight against alien monsters known as the Tiao Tie. They came to Earth via a meteorite and attack the humans once every 60 years. However, with the soldiers suffering ambushes from a horde of these Tiao Tie monsters, Garen and Tovar decide to help out and show off their incredible battle abilities. They effortlessly manage to kill some of these monsters, save young warrior Peng Yong from getting slayed, and by doing this, they eventually earn the respect of the Nameless Order. But with the Tao Tie Queen reviving her horde and making her army invincible, the duo realizes that their only chance to help save humanity is by killing the Queen. 
Well, say hello to the reptilian race that invaded China from a world that isn't really known to us. When we say reptiles, we mean these green-colored quadrupeds that are, of course, carnivorous in nature. They have these membranous head frills that kind of reverberate and let them communicate with each other, even when they are miles apart. These creatures also have intricate motifs right on the top of their skulls, and their leathery skin texture have these shimmering jade-like looks. The creatures are classified into three types, soldiers, queen's guards, and of course, the queen. The soldiers are the most common ones, boasting the size of a lion, but looking a lot more similar to a hyena. They have yellow eyes that are placed on their shoulders instead of their heads, four-fingered forepaws featuring sharp claws and opposable thumbs. While the head has eye sockets, it still looks like a skull. The soldiers also have multiple rows of needle sharp teeth, wide opening jaws and a short tail. Now, when it comes to the queen's guards, they are lesser in number, each resembling the size of an elephant, but with an ape-like appearance. They have human-like hands that are strong enough to lift a small Tautier soldier. Their head is flatter, and they have these retractable frills on their shoulders, which majorly act as their shields. It goes without saying that they are a lot beefier, armored, and mostly seen forming a defensive circle around the queen. Lastly comes the queen herself, who is bigger than the soldiers, but shorter than her guards. It would not be wrong to say that she looks more like a lizard, even a dinosaur for that matter, one with an extended squat body, overlying plates on her back, and a long whip-like tail. She has a protruding forehead and has a 24-7 growling expression on her face. The highlight of her look happens to be the two horns that resonates to signs and indications to her troops. After all, she is the one who commands and controls the hordes. Mind you, the queen is very intelligent and strategic. Her most important duty is to breed, something that is directly proportional to the amount of regurgitated food that's given to her by the workers. Buraki, D-War. Shim Hyung Rae's 2007 action-adventure fantasy flick was not just the most expensive Korean movie in history, but also a major box office success. One fails to wonder why did the movie end up garnering such negative reviews from the critics? Well, if we look at the plotline, it is pretty simple. Based on the Korean legend, once in every 500 years, primeval mythical creatures come to Earth and wreak unimaginable havoc, one that literally leads to the destruction of the planet. But only this time, they must be stopped at every cost. Those who had not had the opportunity to watch this flick might be wondering what exactly is the Buraki? Well, besides the main antagonist of the movie, the Buraki is a dark Imugi who has aspired to become the new celestial dragon so that he could demolish both the planet as well as heaven and rebuild them as a way that he wanted to. As per the legend, in exchange for the benefits of compassion offered to Imugi, laid out to humanity, the said Imugi would be bequeathed a Yaoiju, which happens to be a source of undescribable power that would transmute it into a celestial dragon. Coming back to the draconic god wannabe, he was possibly the most vicious Imugi, one with evil intentions of stealing the Yaoiju, becoming a celestial dragon, and after that, annihilating Earth as well as Heaven, reconstructing them in his own way. Buraki was also the commanding leader in the Atroc army, one that was formed by twisted beasts resembling theropod dinosaurs, western dragons, and fog-like creatures. Shedding light into the particular monster's personality, he is absolutely brutal, loathed, unrestrained, and quite spiteful. He will go to any extent to obtain the Yawiju, even if that means killing someone and he will do it, having on display one of the most powerful jaws ever, and a pair of fiery orange eyes with slit pupils. This dark-hued slender monster boasts impenetrable skin, massive strength, super speed, and is even actually capable of mystically sensing the girl having the celestial power. It doesn't matter how far away he is from her, he will find her. The fact is that he mastered the art of dark magic, 
and was also quite visible when he cast the spell with dark clouds around the U.S. Bank Tower, or let's say accountable for the deformations of his minions. The Basilisk, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets It is Harry Potter's second year at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, but before he leaves for school, he is paid a visit by a house elf named Dobby, who warns him not to go back to Hogwarts. Harry Potter must not go back to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry this year. Harry does not pay any heed to his warnings, and despite hindrances caused by the house elf, Harry manages to return back to school. However, strange and inexplicable things begin to occur. Students start becoming petrified, and Harry keeps hearing a voice, one that appears to come from inside the walls. No one seems to know who or even what is doing these things. Soon, the trio of Harry, Ron, and Hermione begin their investigation, and that's when they get to know the story of the Chamber of Secrets, and that only the true heir of Salazar Slytherin will be able to open it and control the monster which roams inside. The chamber is said to be home to something that only the heir of Slytherin can control. Nonetheless, with the chamber being opened and the lives of the students at risk, it is up to Harry Potter and his friends to unravel the mystery of the chamber. The Basilisk, also known as the Serpent of Slytherin, was placed in the Chamber of Secrets by Salazar Slytherin and she could only be controlled by the true heir of Slytherin, in this case, Tom Riddle, Voldemort's younger self to be precise. Back in 1943, Riddle had set free the Basilisk on school grounds, with the aim of getting rid of all the Muggleborns. While most of the targets were petrified, a Ravenclaw Muggleborn student named Myrtle Warren was a direct victim of the Basilisk, who had died when the creature looked straight at her. Riddle had framed Rubius Hagrid, who was a Gryffindor third year back then, and stated that it was Hagrid's pet Acromantula, Aragog, which was accountable for all the attacks. While Hagrid was expelled, the attacks did stop, but Dumbledore, having been doubtful of Riddle, kept him on his radar and stopped him from causing any more trouble at the school. Hagrid was eventually brought back to Hogwarts as the gamekeeper. Riddle left behind a diary that contained a part of his very soul in the hopes that one day would let him take control of a host, reopen the chamber, and resurrect the Basilisk. And we all know how that turned out. Anyway, coming back to the Basilisk itself, it goes without saying that she was exceedingly powerful, possessing extreme levels of strength, durability, and the fact that she was resistant to most of the spells made her absolutely dangerous. Victims who have directly looked at her have met their unfortunate demise, and those who have indirectly looked at her have become petrified. Those yellow deep eyes and the dark green scales on her body made the beast look all the more petrifying. No pun intended. Let's not miss out on those fangs either, that were so poisonous that she could literally kill anyone within minutes of her piercing through them. Mind you, even when she got blinded, she could still detect her prey through sound and smell. Speaking of the beast's personality, she had quite a sadistic nature, always bloodthirsty, and viciously went to the extent of attacking her victims, no matter how many obstacles lay in front of her. Also, in spite of her bloodthirsty nature, the creature never really fed on any of her victims. Her stare was more than enough. Giant Anaconda from Anaconda. A film crew journey through the Amazon River to track down a long lost indigenous tribe called the Shurashamas and shoot a documentary on them. On their way, they come across a stranded Paraguayan stranger named Paul Saron from a sinking boat. Saron offers to aid the crew in their search for the tribe, claiming that he has evidence of the tribe's existence and knows how to find them. Your people saved my life. This I can do. I can show you exactly where I saw the. However, in reality, he is a snake hunter, and his only mission in life 
is going after the giant record-breaking green anaconda that he has been tracking for quite some time now. In due course and cunningly, Saran takes over the boat and drags along with him the crew members on his mad quest of capturing the colossal snake. The giant anaconda here is popularly known for wreaking havoc, not only in the 1997 adventure movie, but also in Hollywood. The film is a classic creature chomp fest that features the eponymous snake in all its glory. It is twice or maybe three times the size of a regular anaconda, having augmented strength, ferocity, endurance, unusual speed, flexibility, and let's not miss out on its level of intelligence. Mind you, it is very much capable of consuming its prey in just a matter of seconds. Hats off to its metabolism, for it hardly needs time spanning from a few minutes to maybe an hour or so when it comes to digesting its newly eaten target. The creature can effortlessly put up a fight, even after consuming a full-grown man. It is a different thing that its fighting skill might get hampered a little, and there is a high chance that it might be coerced into regurgitating. The giant anaconda featured in the movie is always hungry, and it has a penchant for devouring humans. While in real life, anacondas mostly have rounded pupils. The one featured in the film has slanted pupils, deliberately making it one of the most underrated, villainous, and deadliest of reptilian monsters as shown in the movies. Lizzie, Rampage Primatologist Davis Okoye, who also happens to be a former U.S. Army Special Forces soldier, shares a very special bond with a rare albino western lowland gorilla named George, who he has saved from poachers that had killed his mother. Since then, Davis had been communicating with the gorilla using sign language. But when a gene manipulation company, Energen's experiment goes wrong, George, along with a few other unsuspecting animals across the country, get accidentally exposed to the gene-mutating pathogen. This leads them to mutating into aggressive, voracious monsters of gargantuan proportions, one who destroy literally anything and everything that crosses their path. Davis joins hands with the genetic engineer, Dr. Kate Caldwell, and together they try their best in finding out an antidote before the creatures lead the world to a global catastrophe. Lizzie happens to be an American crocodile from the Everglades, who not only got inadvertently exposed to one of the pathogen canisters, but also had swallowed the whole of it. No wonder she gets mutated and turns out to be much larger than her counterparts. This makes her way more powerful and durable than George, the mutated gorilla, or even Ralph, the mutated wolf. Hell, she is even capable of handling both of them at the same time. Her body is durable enough to more attacks, especially hits from bullets, missiles, or even bombs for that matter. Lizzie is four-footed, has elephant-like tusks from her upper jaw, a tongue that is covered in spikes, and with those multiple layers of razor-sharp teeth, anything is easily crushed, including helicopters to the extent of severing Ralph's head and severely mauling George. Of course, she can swim, but she also has this improved ability to breathe underwater for a prolonged time period because of the fish-like gills on her neck. But the highlight of her whole look is that neck frill, which she opens whenever she feels intimidated, and from it emerges a row of large spines that runs down her entire back. She also has a tail club, one that she can effortlessly make use of, rather like a mace, to simply crush, or let's say smash things with it. Then there's her enormous gecko-like feet, each boasting exceedingly sharp claws. Do watch out for Lizzie in Brad Payton's 2018 science fiction monster flick, one where big meets with bigger. Dino Shark from Dino Shark. Kevin O'Neill's 2010 low budget sci fi horror flick is a loose remake of the late Charles B. Griffith's 1979 horror flick, Up from the Depths, 
The movie begins with a baby pleosaur making its way out of a broken chunk of an arctic glacier, one that broke free due to the effects of global warming. The storyline then moves ahead three years, and the same shark is now all grown up and is on a literal rampage, killing the unsuspecting tourists and the locals offshore in the Mexican beach resort of Puerto Vallarta. The prehistoric sea reptile bears a lot of resemblance with a Mosasaurus, or an Ichthyosaurus for that matter. Now add to this its crocodilian scales, and a head that looks more like that of a Tyrannosaurus rex. No points for guessing its exceedingly powerful jaws and razor sharp teeth. There you have yourself the Dino Shark, that is close to say 25 to 30 feet. This ferocious apex predator is more like a blast from the past, one that can jump the way a dolphin does, and mind you, it is impeccably fast. It can literally go to extents when it comes to chomping off helicopters, and even people who are parasailing. Let's not even talk about its dino appetite for that matter. No matter how much or how many it eats, it is always hungry and is in a constant mood for more. No reason not to love this movie here, especially if you are into creature features. Boogans from the Boogans. A group of four construction workers are employed to restore a long uninhabited silver mine in Colorado that was forcibly shut down by the military after a mysterious massacre about a hundred years ago. But what the group is not aware of is that their digging has accidentally set free some of the reptilian creatures that had been skulking deeper within the very mine shafts. No wonder these creatures began wreaking havoc right after they get released. We know the title of the movie states Boogans, but please don't make the mistake of confusing these monsters as creatures that emerge from the noses of people, and stereotypically inflicting the green slimy dread. Director James L. Conway's 1981 monster flick conclusively falls under the Creatures Under the Ground category, and is bound to run chills down your spine throughout the entire runtime of 95 minutes. Meet the main antagonist of the movie, who happen to be a deadly group of man-eating reptilian creatures. They are large, scaly, green in color, and resemble giant turtles, but with big black eyes and piercing teeth. They have shells which are wrinkled and look a lot like brains. They also have forelimbs that are long tentacle-like, but end in sharp clubs. They also have two more limbs which are like crab-like claws. The highlight of these monsters happen to be their roars, Mind you, they are stock roars, but it still has that loud roushes effect on you even by today's standards. <laughs> Wondering what this creature's weakness is? Well, one literally has to blow up the entire mine shaft to kill these creatures. There's no other way than that. War Bats, Godzilla vs. Kong Although it's been five long years since the epic battle between Godzilla and his arch-nemesis Ghidorah took place, the world is still shaken. Humanity, in due course, has started attempting to coexist with the Titans, but with the fearsome Godzilla commencing his own reign of terror, humanity is left with no other option but to call on yet another legend, the mighty Kong, to stop him. With Godzilla raging across the nation and literally exterminating everything in his path, the fate of the world lies in the hands of these two legendary titans, as both Kong and Godzilla fight for the title of the right king, but also bond together to prevent the real threat that lies ahead of them and save humanity as well. So wondering what are the war bats? Well for starters, they're huge serpent-like, and are capable of flying. These grey reptilian monsters have membranous wings that run down the top part of their bodies, and are supported by long spikes that are mainly extensions of the ribcage. One look at their torso and you will see the resemblance to a snake, a cobra to be specific. They look pretty much intimidating, thanks to their protruding giant fangs, as well as the razor-sharp teeth. Mind you, their eyes are green and their pupils look more like that of a cat's, as they are horizontal. 
The bony ridge above their eyes also makes them look a lot more like crocodiles. In short, they are literally a mix of the deadliest of all the reptiles that there are. The highlight of these creatures has to be their roars, especially the deep raspy ones. Here's an interesting trivia that you might find intriguing. If you pay attention to the trailer, especially the part where the war bats make their appearance, you will notice that the high-pitched screeches that they make are the same ones as those of the xenomorphs made in the Alien film franchise. We know you want to rush out and watch the trailer again, but we're not done yet. So stay with us for just a little longer. These creatures are subterranean, and they are roaming around the rainforests of the hollow earth. Mind you, they are aggressive enough to wrap their serpentine body around their prey and kill them. This is where their wings come in handy. They can be used to smother their prey, especially their face. They are very durable, agile flyers. Ones that can literally spray poison from glands that are situated inside their wings. These creatures are mostly seen hunting in a pack, and if not, then in pairs. Also, the fact that their origin still remains a mystery to the audience easily makes them one of the deadliest reptilian monsters ever. Piranacondas from Piranaconda Jim Wynorski's science fiction B-movie revolves around a hungry monster that is part killer snake and part killer fish, one that gets awakened from a long slumber to relish itself on human flesh. The film begins with Professor Lovegrove, an expert herpetologist, who is bent on finding the eggs of the colossal Piranaconda that roams around the Hawaiian jungles. He, along with his team, manages to enter the den of the monster. While at the same time, a film crew is also there, making a slasher flick in the middle of the jungle, oblivious to the fact that some maniac criminals are keeping a close track on all their moves. But given the situation, the criminals should be the least of their concerns, especially when they have the enormous toothy predator lurking in the shadows, waiting to pounce on them. More like a cross between a red-bellied piranha and a green anaconda, the movie features three types of specimens, one male and two females. The male happens to be darker green in color, with orange spots on it, and the females are shaded yellowish green with yellow spots on them. The fin on their tails makes them swim faster, and believe us, that is scary. It goes without saying that they are humongous, almost petrifying to look at, and boast a rather sharp, pointed set of teeth. Their mating season lasts for literally 11 months, so you can imagine their heightened sex drive, and it's only during this very phase that these creatures are hyper-aggressive, be it towards anybody that crosses their paths, or they cross their paths with. They are oviparous in nature, which means that they can lay up to 25 eggs at a time. They are so protective of their eggs that they actually lay them in places that are hard to reach. So you can imagine the wrath of the Piranacondas when the scientists actually try to steal their eggs. Poseidon Rex from Poseidon Rex When diver Jackson Slate is coerced by the Caribbean kingpin to dive into the great blue hole for the lost Mayan treasure, he inadvertently sets free a prehistoric Tyrannosaurus Rex type creature from its hibernation. The voracious reptilian creature starts terrorizing a small island off the coast of Belize and goes on a killing spree both underwater as well as on land. Slate teams up with a group of people that includes boater Henry, couple Rod and Jane, and marine biologist Sarah. Together, they try retrieving the lost Mayan golds from the water, unaware that there is a deadly beast waiting for them down there, one who is literally starving to dig into human flesh. The titular creature has been living underneath the bottomless pit of the water for years, making itself a little too comfortable there, laying eggs. With a bunch of humans entering its underwater realm, the apex predator saw its chance for a new prey and thus began attacking, consuming literally anything that dared to cross its path. The Poseidon Rex happens to be amphibious, and the sole fact that it can exist both on land and in water makes it all the more scary. Its powerful legs are proof of the fact that it's just as fast on land as it is under the water. 
The creature is exceedingly strong, given its enormous size and brawny structure. It has extreme levels of durability, and is quite capable of withstanding a multitude of gunshots. Mind you, the creature can literally swallow a whole human, and even go to the extent of sinking medium-sized boats. We wish we could tell you that we were kidding, but unfortunately we are not. Don't believe us? Well, just give this 2013 horror flick a chance. Terracuda Sharktopus vs. Terracuda Matt Yamashita's 2010 sci-fi original horror flick takes place after the very events of the first film. The CEO of Simodrome, Dr. Rico Symes, sets free a hybrid creature, one that begins to be a cross between a barracuda and a pterodactyl, ignoring the warnings of his team members. With the impressible creature going on a rampage, Symes, along with the head of security, Hamilton, comes to a deadly conclusion. The duo make up their minds to make use of an equally deadly enemy from the past to stop the Terracuda from wreaking further damage. Now, with two monstrous creatures running amok, a marine biologist devises a plan to kill both the creatures. As the name suggests, Terracuda has the wings and body of a pterosaur and the tail of a barracuda. Credits to the fin on its head, along with the large crudal fin at the end of its tail, that this monster was capable of steering through both air and water. Even the thought of this has enough to send shivers down our spines. This reptilian creature is highly capable of swimming underwater, maintaining an incredible velocity, and its saber-like stabbing teeth always worked in the favor of its hunting skill. The insatiable appetite of the terracuda always made it hungry for more, and it goes without saying that it simply loves to devour humans. Deinonychus, Carnosaur. Dr. Jane Tiptree is a brilliant but an inquisitive geneticist who has plans of exterminating the entire human race and replace them with dinosaurs instead. However, there are two people who stand in the way of her nefarious plan. While one happens to be the watchman Doc Smith, the other is an environmental activist, Anne Thrush. With Dr. Tiptree, all is set to release her prehistoric death-defying creations. It is up to the duo to stop Dr. Tiptree from executing her evil plans. With Dr. Tiptree tampering with the DNA of chickens, the genetically modified chickens end up hatching reptilian creatures, a Deinonychus to be more precise. Right from the time that the creature escapes, it goes on a killing spree and literally tears up the local town. From the list of its victims, it is quite clear that the Deinonychus absolutely revels when it comes to killing the humans. The movie has the monster going through three significant changes. There is the hatchling, where it is small and almost covered in feathers, but do not make the mistake of judging it by its looks. There is a particular scene in the movie where the creature, right after hatching, it kills the driver and then flees. Next, it becomes a sub-adult, where it grows larger and has scales. Finally, it is an adult, where it is fully developed and scaly. We invite you to take a look for yourself, but mind you, it is absolutely terrifying to look at. If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to send a like and subscribe to our channel, if you haven't already. For Marvelous Videos, I'm Rylan. Have a good one, be safe, and thanks for watching. <laughs>